patients transferred back whom we had never actually come in contact with. They had come into the emergency department and quite rightly were scanned and transferred immediately. And the next thing is we had patients come back for rehabilitation um, and uh, many of them uh, with the tracheostomies, many of them with a piece of their uh, cranium that had been decompressed. And, and really not knowing how to manage these people, what was the trajectory for these people. And of course, as we all know, the National Rehabilitation Hospital has been uh, really underfunded and understaffed for many years. And so access for these uh, to, to rehabilitation was difficult. And then, of course, we all had on general surgical wards, we had our uh, chronic head injuries who were too young to go into long-term care, uh, being under 65. And I mean, every uh, general surgical uh, unit in the country will have had somebody for nine, 12, even 18 months um, in, in, in beds where we really were not looking after them as well as we should have. So I think it is a, it is for general surgeons, it's an orphan area that we really do need to get um, an in-service about. And maybe, uh, and it's, it's not a, a litany of complaint, it is, it's a statement of fact. And so I think it would be very helpful to hear Ken Mealy set the scene from a general stand, uh, general surgeon standpoint. And then we look forward very much uh, to Mr. Javapur telling us about what uh, what is what really has uh, 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 happened in neurosurgery in the major uh, unit in Beaumont Hospital and how we can probably better uh, interact and liaise for the better outcome of patients. So Ken, I'll leave it to you to start. Thank you, President. And um, the, the good news is I've only got three slides. I thought I was going to come behind uh, Mohsen and he, he would have told you all you need to know um, about neurosurgery, not that I'm going to tell you, but I, I, I'm going to give a perspective from working in a, a, a smaller hospital. Um, and you've actually touched on a lot of the issues that I am going to address, um, Ronan. Um, and the other disclosure is I'm not a professor, so um, I need to get that out there. Um, I, I thought I'd just give you some of the national data. Uh, th this is the HYPE 2019 data set. Um, there's just under 3,000 discharges <coughs> for intracranial injury. These are trauma cases. Um, and you can see they're, they're fairly well split between the Model 3 and the Model 4 hospitals. And if you look at the discharging consultants, um, just under 200 consultants discharge these uh, just under 3,000 patients. So you, you know, on average, the, 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 the average general surgeon around the country is probably discharging 12 to 15 head injuries every year. So it's not uncommon, uh, but uh, I refer back to it in a moment, the, the, that sense of unease that the president indicated about looking after patients out, out with one's specialty. Um, intracranial injury is a considerable burden on the health service. The average length of stay is 5.8 days. Um, taking up nearly 30,000 bed days in the country. Um, and you can see the, the other sort of summary metrics we get from the HYPE data set, uh, readmission rate of 7.4%. And, you, you know, not an inconsiderable mortality, 6.1% of patients die. So can we have the next slide, please? Uh, as you might, and, and th these are the sort of explorer views you can get with the HYPE data set. You can look at the age profile. So for most of the diseases that we deal with as general surgeons, uh, there's a very specific age profile, but you can see here that, that head injuries occur right across the age, maybe more for the elderly, but also a significant number of young people, as you might imagine. The vast majority of patients stay in only a few days, but the span is, is very considerable. And um, last year, the maximum uh, Lent to stay for a patient with a head injury was 575 days. And I can say with considerable amount of confidence that patient who stayed in 575 days 
is a patient of mine and has been on our ward for the last four or five years. And you might say that doesn't add up to 575 days. Um, but f on, on a few occasions, that patient went up to Beaumont. Um, so each time uh, that he, he comes back, it, it's a new admission. Uh, and so I've had a patient, a young patient with an acute brain injury, uh, with a GCS of seven, uh, with a tracheostomy uh, tube in situ um, on uh, enteral feeding on my ward for the past six years. As you might expect, um, it, it is a fair mix between males and females, but predominantly male. Uh, and also interestingly, in terms of um, uh, capacity planning, uh, these patients are admitted any day of the week, you know, seven days, uh, very similar admission numbers. Um, and of the, as, as I said, the mortality is 6.1%, uh, um, about 183 deaths out of the 2,954 patients. Um, and the vast majority of these patients, as you can see with the chart and comorbidity index, that's an indicator of comorbidities, the vast majority of these patients are, 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 are below two. So they're, they're healthy, fit, young patients prior to coming into hospital. So perhaps we could have uh, my third and last slide. And, and these are just the issues that, that I think may be helpful in, in, in the discussion uh, later on. And I'm not quite sure whether Keith Sinnott is on the uh, is 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 on the um, is is talking tonight, but I I thought I would give him an introduction. But by, by uh, I see Keith is there. Thanks, Keith. Your hand is up. So I thought this might be an introduction for you for, for you to talk earlier on because I, I would like to hope a lot of the things that I'm going to mention uh, and I suspect Mosin is going to also talk about. Uh, we would like to see dealt with in the, in the trauma system for Ireland report and the implementation of that which hopefully is going to happen over the next couple of years. So the president um, indicated some of the things that I, I'm concerned about. And the, the first is the referral and transfer process. Um, th this is really problematic and can be really problematic because there's clearly a capacity issue in, in the neurosurgical units, not just in Bowman, but Cork is equally bad. In fact, Cork is probably even more problematic. And it is remarkably stressful as a non-neurosurgical consultant, particularly working in a smaller hospital with minimal collegial support, looking after a patient where you really know this patient will be looked after better in another unit. And um, even those patients who you know may not need um, neurosurgical intervention, um, it's quite clear that the outcomes are better for these patients um, if they're appropriately monitored with intracranial pressure monitoring in a specialized unit. And because of the capacity issues, uh, it is not in, uncommon where it's problematic in getting these patients transferred. And, and clearly part of, of, of this process is, is um, communication uh, and and I think Mohsen will, will, will probably refer to that in his talk. And, and this can be difficult. Um, neurosurgeons are busy people. They tend to, when, to, when they're on call, to be in the operating theatre. And sometimes it is hard to have that consultant-consultant um, interaction. And I'm, I'm not saying this as a criticism, as I say, because it, it's absolutely understandable uh, when you're on call with huge numbers of admissions on a daily basis, when you are operating, that you cannot be contactable. But it strikes me that there has to be a better system. And, and you know, perhaps we can talk with Keith Sinnott later on in the trauma report um, uh, implementation. It, I think there should be a role, there should be a role for perhaps a coordinator like we have for transplants, uh, a neurosurgical coordinator where there's always a go-to person uh, that can um, pass on information in, in a timely fashion. Because as I say, the consultants are frequently in theatre, as are the registrars, and frequently as a consultant, you're SHO, which is, which is problematic. 
Um, so I, I think th th there is work we can do, and, and you'd like to see this in the in, in the trauma report implementation. And how do how do we speed up that that transfer process? And that that then brings me on to the actual mechanics and logistics of a transfer process. Um, we've made some progress in the country over the last number of years with with automatic protocols for long bone fractures and hip fractures for trauma and orthopedics. And it strikes me that there, there clearly has to be potential for patients with serious uh, intracranial injuries. Um, the paramedics are increasingly skilled uh, and trained up in this regard to, to, to scoop up patients and bring them immediately to a neurosurgical center. Uh, this would save hours and hours in terms of uh, admission to a peripheral hospital, having somebody scanned, arranging a transfer, uh, and then the transfer process. So uh, I think that's something, again, I would like to discuss and uh, brought into the transfer protocols and implementation of the trauma report. And then also then in this issue uh, of guidelines, and I think we're all fairly familiar with the NICE guidelines. Um, but again, some feedback from the neurosurgical units would be helpful, particularly with children. Um, you look at NICE guidelines and, you know, if as a child you vomit more than two or three times, you're supposed to have a CT scan. You know, that, that's, that's difficult and, and maybe nonsensical in many cases. Um, and perhaps having that sort of um, liaison person coordinator would help in defining what guidelines are, giving feedback to, to, to surgeons in, in smaller hospitals. So I think those are issues that perhaps we can discuss later, and I would be very keen to hear what Keith Sinnott's take would be on, on those issues in terms of um, uh, implementation of the trauma report. Um, I have to comment about rehabilitation. I've already alluded to the fact that, the fact that I have a patient uh, in our, uh, on an acute surgical ward for the last five, over five years with an acute brain injury. This is the least appropriate patient, uh, place for this patient. Um, I am absolutely gobsmacked that he's still alive, and that's a credit to my nursing colleagues and our therapy uh, uh, support colleagues, our physiotherapists and uh, 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 occupational therapists. Um, and it's absolutely clear that when uh, patients are discharged back from Beaumont, um, we, we need to really have a much more robust rehabilitation protocol. And again, that's not a criticism uh, of the, the National Rehabilitation Hospital um, in, in Dunleary. Um, I've had numerous conversations with Mark DeLarge. He has visited it on occasion uh, when we've had uh, patients, uh, problem patients that in, in need of rehabilitation. Uh, again, it's a capacity issue and, and one would love to see this uh, um, supported and more resource going into it in, in the future. Um, and, and then just finally on the trauma report, I, I've alluded to, the, to, to, to these and I'm sure Mohsen can, can, can address it better than I can. There is clearly uh, capacity issues in the neurosurgical units. Um, it has to be a, a um, ideal that anyone would have defined serious uh, neurosurgical inj injury, whether they require surgery or not, should be transferred and looked after in a neuro neurosurgical unit. Um, I've alluded to bypass protocols and transfer policies and, and rehabilitation. Uh, I think these are issues that concern all of us. Uh, I'll, I'll end by saying something that I often say to uh, our trainees. Um, working in, in smaller hospitals is different. It's different in the sense that you're not anonymous and you're very exposed and many sick patients have a political dimension to it. And yes, we should treat everybody equally, but if you have um, a prominent individual's family member sick, or if you have uh, somebody who has political connections and you have TDs ringing you complaining about why did you not do A, B or C, um, one comes under an awful lot of scrutiny. And on that basis, you do look after patients in peripheral hospitals in a different way because of that exposure. And the political implications of major trauma, particularly in young patients, uh, fits into that category. And anything that we can do 
to build on the important communication skills and the collegiality in managing um, trauma uh, at an integrated level has to be supported. And that's why I, for one, uh, support the Trauma System for Ireland and look forward to its implementation. And finally, I will um, indicate what, what the president also said. I have huge respect and admiration for the neurosurgical units. I suspect of all the surgical teams that are on call on a nightly basis, the neurosurgeons have to work harder than any of the rest of us because they really do work essentially 24-7. Uh, I know what the lists are like in Beaumont and in Cork. Uh, they have a list of half a dozen cases most days that they have to get through uh, and uh, they, they um, warrant our, our thanks and support uh, in, in, in the future, uh, as I say, as the trauma support, uh, the trauma system is implemented. So thank you. Um, um, I've kept that deliberately short because I, I would like to see a, a general discussion about these issues later on. Thanks a lot, President. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken. And uh, I think you've set the scene. You've certainly articulated what uh, most of us as general surgeons dealing with head injuries um, uh, have concerns about. And so, uh, Moshen, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, um, President, and also Ken. Uh, my slides are coming up. Uh, I think I completely agree. This is a really important topic. Um, it's a difficult topic. It's a, uh, it's a topic that probably requires more than just one session of discussion uh, because there are so many issues to cover. But I'll go through some stuff that's very basic and then touch on other things that some of uh, that uh, both President and Ken have already mentioned. And I'll go through it as best as I can. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to put some definitions out there. TBI on my slides means traumatic brain injury. Minor uh, TBI is those with GCS of 13 to 15. Moderate TBI, GCS 9 to 12, and severe TBI is those with a GCS of uh, less than 9. Next slide, please. So this is the problem. It's already been mentioned in that capacity is our problem. I've put up in the middle column there the Society of British Neurosurgery guidelines that came out 20 years ago advising that neuro ICU beds should be four per million. So uh, Beaumont, by the standard of, 20, of 2000, should have 14 neuro ICU bed. It has eight. It should have 30 beds, uh, neuro ward beds per million. Uh, in other words, 105 for a catchment population of three and a half million. And we have 67. And just bear in mind, these are the standards put out 20 years ago. Um, next slide, please. So um, just so that we look at some numbers, um, we've audited for a number of years now the number of referrals that we get uh, and more recently have been putting it into a, an electronic uh, referral system, which I'll talk about at the end. But uh, essentially the on-call neurosurgical registrars uh, and ourselves being on call receive 8,200 uh, referrals per year, so about 23 calls per day. This does not include pediatrics neurosurgery, which is now referred to Temple Street for all under 16 year olds. And those referrals include anything from traumatic brain injury, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, brain tumors, hydrocephalus, and the rest of the list that you can see in front of you. Of the 8,200 referrals per year, and we, take, we, ta we get about 1,500 calls per year so about four per day that are traumatic brain injury. Next slide, please. So in terms of just going through some of the guidelines, you've talked about NICE guidelines um, and, uh, and the Brain Trauma Foundation, essentially who should be transferred to neurosurgery. There are some very obvious ones. So anybody with a space occupying hematoma, that obviously that requires evacuation. Some of the more delayed things tend to be um, traumatic hydrocephalus or those with a traumatic aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm, uh, those with an open depressed skull fracture, those who have a persistent CSF leak being through their wound or 
uh, through the nose or ear if it's persistent we would take that and so often actually uh, repair those together with our ENT colleagues. The important group I think that um, you've all been discussing is that NICE guidelines would say that all patients with a GCS of less than nine, so anyone with a severe TBI, irrespective of whether they need a neurosurgical procedure, they should really be in a neuro center. And that's not just because of the presence of a neurosurgeon, it's also because of a neurointensivist, neurosurgical nurses, and everything that goes with it. Uh, that data, that was put in into the NICE guidelines after TARN um, showed that, TARN data showed that if these patients are cared for in a non-neurocenter, there is a twofold increase in the odds of death compared to patients that are treated in a neurocenter. Now, this wasn't a randomized trial, so the two groups weren't identical, but it gives you an idea that if the patient's transferred with a severe brain injury to a neurocenter, they're likely to do better. It's also important to note that 60% of major trauma patients, so those who have an injury severity score of more than 15, have intracranial injury. So that, that list is kind of pretty much people that I think we would all agree should be in a neurosurgical center. But obviously anyone really with a head injury with an abnormal CT scan should be at least discussed with the neurosurgical team. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the um, easy ones for decision making. The scan on the left, on your left, is a, an extradural hematoma with mass effect. And the scan on the right is a, an, an acute subdural hematoma with mass effect. Clearly needs urgent transfer to a neurosurgical center for evacuation. Next slide, please. But some of the patients you've been talking about probably fit this pattern of scan. So the one on the left shows bifrontal contusions. They don't need to be evacuated. At this point in time, the basal cisterns are open uh, and the patient doesn't actually need any actual craniotomy or burr hole or anything like that. But um, 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours later, you might get a lot of brain swelling and, that, and that's when they decline in their conscious level or if they're already intubated, they actually fix and dilate their pupils uh, and die. And these patients require ICP monitoring to allow medical management of their intracranial pressure or a decompressive craniectomy. The scan in the, the um, picture in the middle shows a very much a diffuse pattern of injury with uh, brain swelling and the effacement of the basal cisterns. And these are the patients that we'd like to transfer to Beaumont for ICP monitoring, which you see in the picture on the on your right uh, with a bolt that's inserted into the brain. This one that they've shown here also does the um, tissue oxygen measurement, which we're just about to implement in Beaumont. Next slide, please. So um, patient uh, uh, Ken uh, and and uh, President have been talking about where they can stay on your wards for many, many months with um, part of their skull missing is this sort of patient with um, subdural hematoma, contusions, brain swelling, and that's the intraoperative picture of a decompressive craniectomy. And you can see the swollen brain just protruding out of the craniectomy defect and then we close the skin over that we leave the dura open. This is one of those procedures I think Ken you probably your patient probably went went through and it's one of those procedures we think a lot about and we don't always get it right and the problem is that the you know that it's a life-saving procedure but you also know that potentially you could end up with an extremely disabled person uh, and uh, making the decision as to who you actually do the decompressive craniectomy on and who you don't can sometimes be very, very difficult. Next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about the information that we'd like to hear when, when we receive a call. Um, I like actually, instead of talking about GCS, maybe to talk about EMV, because they, when you add those numbers together, it's not quite as helpful because the motor response is really important to us. It's the most important prognostic factor is the motor response. So we much prefer if you break it down 
into eye-opening motor response and verbal response separately. Pupil size and response to light is obviously extremely important, especially in unconscious people, in un unconscious patients, because it's your only um, measure of intracranial pressure unless we get our hands on them and put an intracranial pressure monitor in. And then obviously the basics, pulse and blood pressure, any focal neurological deficit. Is there an open wound? Is there CSF leak? Uh, and obviously other injuries uh, and some of these other injuries could take priority over, over the head injury if the patient has major intra-abdominal injury that needs to be sorted out first. Comorbidities and any antiplatelets and anticoagulants and the new anticoagulants have caused us a, a lot of problems particularly the ones that can't be easily reversed. Uh, next slide, please. Now, talking about management uh, in a non-neurosurgical center, I just want to cover severe traumatic brain injury. So those with a GCS of eight or less, uh, obviously airway, breathing, circulation. So GCS of less than nine means intubate and then transfer. Uh, assess the pupils regularly in these patients. Sometimes we find that on transfer, people forget to actually check the pupils and on transfer, one or two pupils may become fixed and dilated. And if you are alerted to that, you may want to give extra mannitol or temporarily hyperventilate and just en route to Beaumont manage that raised intracranial pressure. Rapid transfer is obviously key. Um, and I often get asked about intracranial hematoma evacuation in a non-neuro center. Um, in the last nine years I've been in Beaumont, I think that has had to be done once or twice only. It's an extremely rare situation if you're really far from us and the patient is literally dying in front of your eyes, it, a burr hole may have to be made in a, in a non-neuro center, but it is extremely rare and we would prefer if the patient is stabilized and transferred to us. I think the problem with uh, with doing these procedures in a non neurocenter is that they are extremely rare. If you look at the number of extradural hematomas to us uh, in a year, it's probably less than 60 and not all of those require uh, evacuation. For somebody who's not doing it all the time to suddenly have to do it, I think is, is, is very, very daunting. Um, other injuries, as I said, like a major intra-abdominal hemorrhage may take priority over the head injury. Now, you've asked me to talk about the ones that we don't transfer. Uh, so in terms of those with severe uh, brain injury, I suppose it shouldn't actually happen. All of those with a GCS of less than nine should be with us, but I know that it still does happen. Some of those are those with unsurvivable injury with fixed dilated pupils. Some may be very elderly with very poor baseline performance. Uh, and some are with a normal scan with high alcohol levels, which is causing their kind of pseudo uh, reduced GCS. Uh, and that's actually part of the issue with direct transfer of every severe head injury directly to a neurocenter because these patients probably account for about half of those with a GCS of less than nine, and you will just completely swamp a neurosurgical center with its current uh, facilities. Uh, and then regular with, with patients that do end up in your hospitals on a ventilator with a severe brain injury, uh, I suppose, you know, as I say, it shouldn't happen, but when it does happen, regular communication with us in Beaumont is, is very important. And I'll come to that in a minute. Next slide, please. So these are the TBIs referred to us between 7th of March and 28th of October. It's because on 7th of March, we put in a, a, a kind of a referral system that at the moment, our own registrar are filling the data, but I'll show it to you at the end of the presentation. So it's a period of just over six months and it's 877 referrals. Of those, um, 74 fall into the severe category. So only less than 10% of patients uh, fall into the severe category. Uh, another 57 are moderate injury. You could argue all of those 74 plus the 57 should really probably be with us. Uh, and then 721, which is the vast majority are mild head injuries, which are the ones that uh, a lot of you end up ma managing. 
Uh, next slide, please. So what about the management of these patients in, in non-neurosurgical centers? And in fact, you manage all of these, the majority of these, all the mild ones, uh, very few of the, I think less than 3% when I looked at our data of the mild head injuries end up coming to us. And they are usually the ones with a hematoma that we are afraid that it's going to expand and the patients well, and we still bring them over. Um, President asked me, has much changed in the management of these patients uh, since, since you did neurosurgery? And Probably not a huge amount, actually. You know, it still depends on very close neurological observation. And the only good thing nowadays is that all of these patients are getting their CT scans very rapidly at your hospitals. But if the if there is any deterioration in their GCS or they develop new deficits, then repeat CT and rediscussion with with the neurosurgery team is is indicated. Um, just a, one, a word about those patients that have been scanned within six hours of injury and they have a small hematoma, they really need another scan after six hours because sometimes the hematoma can expand within that time period. And then if you haven't scanned them, the first you know about it is when they drop their GCS. The main problem in this group is follow up and rehabilitation. So in six months, we're talking about 720 patients. Uh, in our catchment population, so over a year is mm, close enough to 1,500 patients. And if we were to follow all those patients up in our clinic, we would be able to see nothing else. And rehabilitation, you have talked about, I completely agree. The rehab unit in Dunleary provide an amazing service, but they are hugely under-resourced. Uh, next slide, please. So communication, I think, is something we really have to work on. Believe it or not, over the last eight years we've been, and even longer, we've been working on developing an online neurosurgical referral system. And uh, we have hit every hurdle and problem you can possibly imagine. Um, about four years ago, I had a system that was ready to go and then we realized that all the internet explorers around the HSC hospitals are so old that they couldn't actually handle the system. Um, we got over that problem and then GDPR came on and that had to we had to work on that. And finally, can you go to the next slide please? Uh, we have a system that currently our own registrars sit there at the end of the day and all the kind of notes that they've been taking during the day for each case they are uh, inputting into this um, referral system which we really hope to bring online so that uh, referring hospitals can put in their data and then we can put in our advice and it's all by drop down menus and pretty quick to to fill out uh, next slide please and what we then would do is a pdf letter is emailed um, to you, a hard copy is sent to the referring consultant and the, you're given at the end of the referral a, a referral ID so that you can log into the system and, and look at, at any developments or any advice that's given from our end. I think that would hugely free up the phone that you're all trying to ring in Beaumont because many of the calls that come through to our registrars or SHOs really don't need to be via phone. Some of the brain tumors and things like that could be done via referral system like this to leave that uh, phone free for the more urgent calls. Um, I totally empathize with the situation where a consultant in another hospital is trying to call one of us and can't access it. And I welcome Ken's uh, idea of a, of a coordinator and maybe that's something we should really, really work on. Next slide, please. So uh, I, again, I'm hoping we discuss a lot of things as a discussion. So I think all severe TBIs should be managed in a neurosurgical center. Moderate TBIs require close neurobs and very regular communication with the neurosurgical team. But as I said, most TBIs are actually mild and are managed in non-neurosurgical centers and communication and early action are, are, are the key. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Mohsen, very much. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it really is, we're all indebted to you for the um, 
really very good service and and the very large volume of uh, of cases that you have to deal with and uh, uh, to deal with on average 23 emergency uh, referrals per day is an enormous undertaking and uh, I think actually the suggestion of a coordinator uh, as being somebody whose entire role it is to try to triage because with that volume of of work coming in the door I mean if this was an emergency department you would have an experienced person triaging and contacting uh, the relevant services very quickly and I think that would be a, certainly as somebody who has uh, <coughs> been on the other end of the phone trying to get through um, and insisting that uh, uh, somebody be transferred because one knew that uh, the outcomes would be better. Um, I, I think somebody that that would be a key appointment if you could do that. Um, the mm -hmm. online referral system also one of the difficulties quite apart from the internet not working or the uh, internet explorer not working is of course not all hospitals are on the the same radiology platform as well which is very tricky. Uh, can I comment on those two? I, I completely agree with you. The In terms of a coordinator We've been trying really hard to have one registrar every day so that they're holding the phone. But as Ken was um, mentioning earlier, it, often that system breaks down because you have one registrar that's off, one registrar that's sick. And then that registrar, which you had, we had in mind to, to hold down call phone, uh, ends up in. No, no, I, and I understand that. And perhaps the solution to this is Either to have a, clinic. um, a, a clinical nurse specialist or exactly. a physician assistant, actually, exactly. might very well be the type of, of, of level. Uh, and uh, that way you've got somebody who is consistently uh, the person who knows, uh, just as we have for cancer care coordinators, uh, the person who runs uh, for example, at St. Vincent's, the person who tells us what we're doing is our cancer care coordinator who who, who really organises everything. Uh, no, I, that's exactly what I was coming to in that I think the system that we've been trying to run with Registrar is, is difficult and that's why a coordinator like you're mentioning would be would be fantastic actually and it's a good idea. Well, any any support we can give uh, for that arising from this meeting, from this webinar, we'd be happy to do so. Um, it, Keith, uh, Keith Sinnott, I, I don't know. I, I think you're there. And uh, yes, you are. You've suddenly appeared on my screen. Uh, so welcome, Keith. I'd be very grateful to hear your comments. Th thanks, thanks, Ronan. Sorry for frightening you by suddenly appearing like that. Um, Thanks very much, most, and that's fantastic. I, I was kind of earlier in the week. I was asked to uh, write something somewhere, and I was described as a neurosurgeon, so I felt very important. But I had to point out to them that I wasn't, in case that somebody thought I had delusions of grandeur. I'm nearly a <laughs> neurosurgeon. Yeah, yeah, about uh, uh, Keith, we've all brain. known that you're just a mere mortal. <laughs> um, I mean, so so much of what you've said is so relevant to the trauma system, um, and it's kind of a shame in lots of ways that so so much of the of the attention is to the kind of major trauma center, which to a large degree is irrelevant because what needs to happen is you need to address capacity, you need to address movement throughout the system, and particularly you need to address egress because it's fairly fairly plain that when you've got a very bad head injury that needs an operation, you get to Beaumont quickly and you get it. Um, and yeah, we can improve things in the system to, to get that to happen and to coordinate things, but it, it's kind of getting out and making sure that the benefits are full benefits are realized. Uh, th there's a few of the things you've spoken about are kind of active and and live as part of the planning for the trauma system. W one you mentioned a coordinator, and actually the the trauma system each of the networks is going to have a trauma coordinator and a rehab coordinator, and um, trying trying to piece together all the different bits. So they'll have kind of two roles to play going in both directions, um, and and hopefully those appointments will be relatively imminent. Um, communication again. It's 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 interesting to hear what you've said because we have we had all the same problems with electronic referrals with the spine service, which is not a million miles away. Um, and again, one of the things we're trying to do as part of the trauma system is to ensure communication across the whole system. And um, things like GDPR are a massive issue, and the unbelievable inertia of the system to introduce any kind of ICT. Um, Enhancements are, are kind of beggar belief in a large way. And 
Mr. President, if there's something the RCSI could help putting pressure on the chief information officer in the HSE to move a little bit more quickly would be really, really useful. And loads of things that have, have, have been spoken about before are kind of good. Um, I, can talk, I can talk for ages about this and I'll try not to, but you mentioned a couple of things. One was um, rapid and direct transfer to the neurosurgical center. Um, and that is something that will probably become more realistic in the trauma system because of well, in, well placed and well thought out triage and transport protocols, a lot of which are in place at the moment. And the other thing that may help that, particularly with regard to, to, to head injuries, is I think three weeks ago, the first um, class of critical care paramedics started training. And ultimately, although there's a bit of way to go, these may be people who can provide things like neuroprotective anesthesia um, in the field and rapidly transfer people. So that, that's all a possibility and something that'll help. You mentioned the difficulty of overloading the system and kind of another, the other end of it will be the concept of repatriation. And currently, I'm sure most of you have the same as we have in the spinal unit, that the tradition is you come from hospital A, you go back to hospital A um, when you've had your initial management, even if hospital A is not the best place for your particular injuries. And even sometimes if hospital A is actually further from where you live because you were on your holidays when you had your accident. So again, the trauma system will work as a network so that your repatriation is to the the facility that's closest to where you live and where you can get what you need. Um, and getting what you need is really the crux of it. And, and, and all of these kind of things, any condition that leaves you with a long term potential for disability and with a requirement to rehab needs rehab. And the rehab side of things is upfront and, and kind of very important in the in the in the what we plan for the trauma system. Um, and there's a few ways of, of, of trying to enhance that. The NRH is underfunded largely because it needs to do more stuff than it does. So the NRH is actually a bit like most in looking after all the minor head injuries. An awful lot of what ends up there doesn't necessarily need to be there because a lot of the patients who are in the NRH could have what they require in an appropriate rehab facility closer to home. I think I saw a figure, and, and, and don't quote me on it because it may not be completely correct, which was that, that about 30% of the patients in the NRH require acute complex specialist rehab, so the high-end stuff. And a lot of the other patients could get their rehab elsewhere. Um, and what we're hoping to do is implement a series of rehab, post-acute rehab facilities around the country as part of the network. Um, and part of it is a bit of a hearts and minds job because currently, and again, you'll all have seen this, patients and the representations from the TDs that you get, Ken, are often because the patient wants to go to Dunleary, even though all they need is something that can happen in the local local community hospital often. Um, and it's to try and encourage people that they're getting the same level of rehab elsewhere. Um, and then the other the other thing with the very complex patients like the one that Ken described that, that we see in, in the in the in the spine world, which again I'm sure is completely the same in the head world, is patients who really do have very significant and expensive rehab requirements. Um, and sometimes these are in the hundreds of thousands of euros per annum is what people require to have nurses uh, available in the home and have healthcare assistance, etc. And currently all of that is delivered by the local community re um, rehab services. And often what you'll find is one patient's, the budget for one patient's care is greater than the budget for that entire community area. So clearly that's kind of a problem that can be solved or that can be difficult to solve. And the other problem is that each community area needs to relearn everything about each of those patients. So another thing that we're hoping to do in the trauma system is to have centralized funding and centralized um, prescribing of rehab needs and of ultimate needs so that rather than it reinventing the wheel each time, you can sit down and say, we know that a patient with this significant brain injury and these rehab requirements needs exactly this. And it's two nurses, 18 hours a day, whatever it turns out to be, and it can be funded centrally. So again, hopefully that will cut out some of the, the round and round and circle stuff that happens. So, I mean, and that's a lot kind of a long answer to a short question, um, but there's huge there's huge areas where significant improvements can be made in the system with the trauma system. And that's quite separate from major trauma centers or anything else. It's all about the, how, how people can flow throughout the system and how we can try and ensure that patients get the rehab they need and also get it quickly. You don't wait for months and months to be assessed to start it. It's only starting kind of behind the eight ball. So and I'm sorry for talking for too long for my bunker, but I hope that's some use. No, well, I, I, thanks, Keith. 
I just see the vice president has her hand up. Yes, I just be interested. Um, what percentage of trauma involves neurosurgery is one question. And are the neuro, is there a neurosurgeon on the trauma uh, assessment committee or, you know, part? Is it part of the sort of the setup at the moment? That's a matter of interest. So uh, will I answer that? The, okay. In terms Either, of percentage, yeah. um, so 60 percent of major trauma uh, involves head injury. OK, uh, and if you look at the data that's coming from all the trauma centers in the UK, mm -hmm. the biggest share of the, uh, you know, the, the most kind of, if you want, uh, present specialty in the in the in the major trauma is, is neurosurgery, it's head injuries, basically, and it's the most important determinant of a poor outcome. So those who, you know, need the, the head injury is a major, major part of major trauma and it's a major de determinant of the outcome. In terms of yeah. the um, presence of uh, neurosurgery, there is, yeah. uh, there wasn't uh, previously, uh, there is now a committee that um, I've been invited to, to take part in uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. So Keith can say more about that, maybe. Can I ask about uh, transfer of, of, of patients? Now, clearly, if there's a, a one hour transfer to the neurosurgical center, um, ground transport, or even uh, 90 minutes. Um, but if you're in Letterkenny and you have a, a case like this, um, is helicopter transfer appropriate? Yeah, so I think um the first thing i would say is helicopter transfer is not always best and my own experience of one of the first helicopter transfers i saw and i know that was a long time ago but as an sho in beaumont i remember they started a helicopter transfer and the patient i think was from mayo uh, and i was called down to the a e in beaumont because the patient's parents who had driven from there had arrived and they were asking me where is the patient <laughs> and the patient in the helicopter still hadn't arrived now i know things have probably improved in helicopter land but uh, there is probably a place for um, helicopter transfer from the more distant places from the closer uh, areas i'm not sure whether it's going to make a huge difference uh, and it's one of the factors to consider. Yeah, the reason I ask is because my wife uh, is a newborn intensive care nurse and they have really an outstanding um, mobile intensive care unit system that transfers these very sick uh, neonates. Uh, but they they do to Mayo and uh, to Donegal and occasionally to Tralee, they do actually helicopter. Do you mind if I come in there for a second, Ronan? Yes, Keith. That's, it's, it's a really interesting and surprisingly complicated question to answer um, because helicopters do different things in different places. And one of the unique things about the helicopters in Ireland are that they are not physician manned. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and also, if you get sick en route, if you're in a helicopter, it needs to land and get you out, whereas a, an ambulance doesn't. And probably the main role for helicopter transfer in these situations is from the field to the major to the to the trauma center the neurosurgical center and um, as opposed to inter-hospital transfer because inter-hospital transfer nowadays with the roads most hospitals are within two and a half or three hours and as most said it's usually quicker to just get in an ambulance rather than waiting for a helicopter and um, there's there's different kinds of, of helicopter that are used at the minute and in fact at the moment there's a very active discussion about pediatric head injuries um, because a lot of these are from remote areas and are transported by helicopter. And there have been some cases where they've been transferred to Cork. And most, and you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but most of the pediatric neurosurgery happens in Dublin, not in Cork. I think the neurosurgical centre in Cork is mainly adult. That's so right. Sometimes have people transported by helicopter to Cork and then they need a secondary transfer. And there's we are working at the moment about direct transfer from everywhere everywhere to Dublin and it's probably the case that if you're in a helicopter it should go to a center that can treat everything rather than go somewhere where you might have to bounce on okay I see uh Hamid Mustafa has a hand up uh, you're welcome to 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 join us if you can put on your uh speaker 
Uh, thanks, President. Uh, just a comment and question for Mr. Javedpur. Uh, thanks very much for such a nice uh, talk. Uh, my question is that uh, the last time I worked in a peripheral uh, level three hospital was a while, but I saw that a lot of injuries were related to um, excessive alcohol intake. What percentage uh, currently, if you have numbers, is related to the uh, alcohol intake? And are there any community awareness programs uh, running uh, to address this uh, issue? I I'm don't sure have that's a question for a neurosurgeon, uh, <laughs> particularly. But I, uh, I don't have a figure for the percentage of alcohol-related uh, injuries, but I can tell you it's large, <laughs> lots, lots of pints. But I, I don't have an answer for the for the community uh, programs, un unfortunately. Well, one question that has come in, uh, Mosen, and it, it's an interesting one. If you have. Uh, looked after somebody with a head injury as a general surgeon and uh, we'll say it's mild or moderate. What are the recommendations about driving uh, for that uh, for that person? I mean, there are clear guidelines if somebody's had a seizure, but what about a head injury? Actually, there are the Road Safety Authority guidelines and they've just published their uh, new version. Um, they they have guidelines for closed head injury that hasn't needed any surgery and uh, hasn't, you know, but it, it depends a little bit on whether there was a contusion on the scan or not. They break it down into different categories. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, they've just revised it, so I don't want to say it off the top of my head, but it's something like a month if there is no seizure and, uh, you know, a, a, a contusion or something like that. But they're very easily downloadable from the Road Safety Authority and it comes down as a PDF file and you can just search, a bra you know, brain contusion or head injury and it'll come up under different categories. And then it depends on CT scan findings, um, any contusions, any subdural, any extradural, any procedure done, any seizures, and then for each of those they will give you, and they give you a different guideline for um, normal cars and for HGVs. Well, well, I actually think that's a very important thing for all the general surgeons on this call because uh, I, for one, was not aware that there were those guidelines, and it would have both safety implications for the individual. Uh, uh, driving, but also I would say quite serious medical legal implications that if you didn't uh, and document that you had warned uh, the individual not to drive um, for the prescribed period. So I would say that that's something we should be aware of. I agree and I just wonder in fact should we have a link to that on the RCSI website or something um, even, even, even as a link that people can look up and then it's very easily downloadable and searchable. Well, well maybe that's something that Kieran uh, might or Porik might take up. Um, and uh, you just once you mention the website, uh, I hope uh, many of you will access the new rcsi.com website and you'll see that it's been reconfigured so that surgery is on the front page. And if you click on the surgery, um, uh, icon uh, that you get into a completely separate uh, uh, web uh, construct that is entirely uh, that for, for, for surgical affairs. And I think if we can put something, a link to that, uh, th that uh, our members and fellows can access, that would be very good. I think uh, if I can come back and ask Ken Mealy, Ken, you asked a lot of questions at the start. Uh, have you any concluding remarks that you that you want to make? Um, there's one or two things I, 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 I'll come back to. The first is, um, and there's a huge political dimension to, to trauma, as Keith knows, and. I had the pleasure of um, attending a meeting in RCSI about four years ago. Uh, it was the first uh, meeting of the Society of British Neurological S Surgeons held in Ireland. And it was the, f I think Richard Kerr was the president at that time, Mohsen. And it was the first time ever that the three neurosurgical centers in this country sat in the same room. And Richard Kerr, 
understanding what he was, he understood exactly what he was saying when he stood up at the end of the meeting and he said, it's quite obvious what should happen in this country to should be one neurosurgical unit. And he said that um, after presentations from the three units. And the, the and I think in Dublin, we, we tend to be, um, I'm saying that because I'm sitting in Dublin now, uh, Dublin centric. The presentation from one of the neurosurgical consultants in Cork um, to, to his deathly silence around the room, uh, the life of that surgeon on a one in three was absolutely horrific. Uh, the lack of resources, uh, the struggle to manage patients' caring and compassionate sense what was just appalling. Now, I, I suspect politically it will never be possible to just have one neurosurgical unit in this country, uh, which would be one solution. Um, but I guess that's a step too far. But, but what I would have a plea for is that if we are having two trauma centres, they both need to be appropriately staffed and funded and resourced because bad and all as the issues are for Beaumont, my suspicion is they're 10 times worse for the Cork Neurosurgical Unit. And, and, and just two other points that came up from the discussion. One, one was um, the, the, the issue in relation to rehabilitation. Keith, you, you, you talked about hundreds of thousands of euro for 24 hour seven. The patient that I have who did indeed have a, a, a craniotomy uh, many uh, four years ago and never had his skull uh, uh, um, flap re reinserted because of, of infection. Um, we, we got it costed for a, a 24 seven care package for him in the community was a million euro a year. And that's one of the reasons why he's still in hospital. And the other reason which you also alluded to <clears throat> was it would come out of a community uh, uh, area budget, a community care budget. And many of us have campaigned for a long, long time that we won't make progress in integrated care in this country until we have complete alignment with, with the community health organizations and the acute hospital groups or the, the regional health areas as, or, or whatever they're going to be uh, called. And it is somewhat disconcerting that Paul Reed seems to be putting that on the back burner so we won't get that alignment and we're always going to struggle in terms of integrated care and getting patients back into the community <clears throat> because the budgets are, are separate. And then the other issue that came up was in terms of GDPR and transfer of data. Um, it might be worth uh, speaking to Colette Tully sometime in NOCA. Um, I put my NOCA hat on being chair of the board, but we, we transfer uh, patient data with for TARN, for the trauma audit, which is UK based, as you know, and there's a whole series of KPIs. Um, so our, all the hospital, uh, Irish hospitals are involved with, with TARN. And, and all the Irish hospitals are, most of them are, are involved with ICNARC, which is the ICU National Audit uh, Centre in the UK also. And we share data with both of those um, audits. Um, and there's been issues in, in, in terms of creating the platform that allows us to communicate with those audits, but they are both very successful. They allow us benchmark standards in Irish hospitals against UK and Irish hospitals. And it might be worth considering with any of our, our data sharing uh, to talk to uh, uh, the NOCA team because they really are expert in terms of GDPR, data management and transfer. So, so that's all I would say. I, I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion. I mean, I think it's absolutely clear we're all on the same page um, and I, I look forward to progress um, and I wish Keith very, uh, all the best in, in implementation of the trauma report. And, and as I also said earlier on, my commiserations to the neurosurgeons, I think they probably have one of the most difficult on-call arrangements uh, because of constraints with resource of all of us. Uh, so I, I very much appreciate the support they've given me over the years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. And just before I, I ask the vice president uh, to come in, I just see on the meeting chat that uh, uh, Dr. Sharbi uh, Charjeep, forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly, has very kindly put up the uh, the uh, link 
uh, to the Road Safety Authority uh, documents. So if anybody wants to get those now, you can go to the chat function and get them. Uh, and then, uh, Laura, did you have your hand up? I was actually at the stage, but I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking most of his colleagues at Bowman Hospital. Um, it's a superb neurosurgical uh, department alongside that in Temple Street. Um, they're always most helpful in every way. And um, I'm delighted to see that he could help us out this evening. Thank you very much, Mosin. And just before uh, we finish, uh, I've had two uh, WhatsApps. Uh, <laughs> Vice President, you'd be glad to know that your better half is watching us in Bahrain. Oh. And what's even more important is that my uh, son is watching us in Cork. So there you are. Uh, <laughs> and both and both are celebrating what has been a very, very good um, uh, webinar. Thank yes. you, Motion. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all for contributing. And we'll try and match the standard next week. Thank you very much. Excellent evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh,